Hello and welcome to the bottom of it with your host Joshua Moriarty. G'day there, welcome back to the bottom of it with me, your host, Joshua Moriarty. How's it going out there? Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for coming back to be a part of the bottom of it. It's another balmy day here in sunny Los Angeles, nothing unusual. It rained the other night and everyone goes crazy when it rains. It's quite magical actually seeing people get so excited about the wet weather. I love it. It sort of makes me feel a little bit like I'm back home because sometimes I get a little bit sad. It's a welcome change to the Groundhog Day that is Los Angeles. I was thinking about it. It feels like every day is Thursday here. Not quite Friday, you know, but there's still a lot of promise and chance on a Thursday evening. A lot can happen, but you're not going to always go mental on a Thursday. That's the kind of place it is. It's like you're you're sort of three quarters turnt in Los Angeles. Hey, uh, enough of that. Enough pre-ramble. I'm going to get into, straight into today's guest. It's Devo's main man, Mr. Mark Mothersbar. What a wonderful chap. What a true artist. It was such a pleasure to sit down and talk to him. Now, Mark was part of Devo, but that's just sort of one facet of what he does. He also does a lot of film and television composition he's been doing that since the 80s now i'm gonna i'm gonna reel off a list of some of his credits he did the rugrats theme song classic you all know that one he did the his work with wes anderson he did the life aquatic he did the royal tenenbaums he's done thor the ragnarok with taika waititi recently he's done the new matt groaning yeah you know matt groaning from the simpsons you ever heard of it mate yeah keep up it's the new show that's on netflix disenchantment which i thought was awesome excellent check it out if you haven't yeah mark mother's bar is a true artist he isn't restricted by any one medium he's made sculptures compositions music videos all sorts of different types of artwork he's been creating pieces since the late 60s then it was his work with devo in the 70s and 80s then on to his film and television work which he does out of his studio mutato musica in los angeles now to read a quote from his website which i think describes him better than i i can it says here an observer among us, Mother's Bar writes down things that he overhears throughout the day. People at another table, a voice on the radio, pieces of verbal fabric that drift and weave and create the poetry of life. The flotsam and jetsam that swirl around us and fill our subconscious with scraps of what it is to be, according to Mother's Bar, a thinking ape. Now it was a treat to sit down with him and have a chin waggle. He was very inspiring and just also a very warm and open guy. We talked about his work with Devo. We talked about his scoring work for Wes Anderson. We talked about speaking in tongues and the idea of surrendering your intellect to the spirit. The theory of de-evolution, Dadaism, the Italian futurist movement. And we have a chat about the Devo song Mongoloid, which is uh, one of my my favorite ones. Anyway, that's that's enough pre-ramble, guys. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Mothersbaugh. Enjoy. I'm building these musical instruments. I've been building them for about eight or nine years. And uh, it's because I got bored with, I got every kind of synthesizer. There's a, one I of imagine the, you only would, 13 yeah. ondialines that are still existed. It's probably the wow. very first synthesizer ever made. I got that one from Pink Floyd. They threw it in the trash. They were rehearsing really? in a room <laughs> really? next to me in 1980. Whoa. And I said, what are you going to do with that? And they go, we just, we need to lighten the load for our tour. So we're getting rid of stuff we're not using anymore. Okay. I've never They've seen that one before. They've replaced like some shiny... Roland synthesizer or something. <laughs> so I got that. But but I mean, I have all, uh, and I've collected esoteric instruments, and it just, I don't want to make the story too long, but I started... Um, make it as long as you want, Mike. I started um, taking, started with bird calls, and I was trying to find ways to, to make a machine that would play them acoustically instead of just sampling them, and then <laughs> you'd have the same sample would play every single time you, you yeah, wanted that particular cuckoo or that particular... Uh, you know, robin or whatever bird you were, you had a bird call for, and so because it sounded because they sound slightly different each time you you blow into them, you can. So I I had a, so I found this guy who repaired calliopes for amusement parks, and he calliopes. He, yeah, uh, steam-driven uh, organs. Right. From the um, like two hundred years ago or a hundred years ago. Sure. Okay. And I have one. 
It's not here. I, I moved it to, I have a, a, an art studio. Yeah, here you just have everything that you use most of the time. So a lot of the stuff is, is in there now, a lot of, yeah. uh, of the more esoteric machines. But I also start. but I built this machine that played 65 different bird calls, and I was writing music for it so that the bird calls were, were making music. And, and it went around on tour with um, some old organ pipes. I, uh, I've been rescuing organ pipes whenever I can because... Practically every week, another old pipe organ gets decommissioned somewhere in the world because... How do you hear about this? Do you, do you track them down? Yeah, I mean, people find out that you're into it, but... You know, yeah, okay. But there, you can find out where all the pipe organs are and where the pieces for sale are and stuff like that. You can, there are people that, that kind of are like still repairing organs that are around the world that are functioning and that they're keeping them in shape. So every now and then they're looking to see what kind of parts they can get, you know. So there's people you can talk to. But I, I've, I've got this warehouse up in kind of northern California that I have. A big one with lots of stuff in it? It's got hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> organ pipes in it that are yeah. anywhere from this long to 14 feet long, this big around. And, and I've been making music. I've been taking those and ma mismatching. They're kind of mismatched because they'll come in from three or four different organs maybe. And... Some will be wooden and very kind of, you know, have that kind of a sound. And some are more metallic sounding and some mm -hmm. of them are more woodwindy and, or brassy or fluty or whatever, or string sounding. And I, I collect them all and I make up uh, sculptures that are... I saw some of these on your website. So you can play, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm you know what I'm sure. talking about. Yeah, so, you yeah. can play, so since I, then I, I've, I'm still doing it and... Um, uh, there's a museum of computer art that wants to take some of them in for about a year or two. They want to display them for a year or two. And so there's, I'm in the process of replacing one of the air boxes that I, I put in one of them. Because they have to work as well, not just look pretty. Yeah, they, yeah, I want them to work because I, yeah. write, I write music for them. And for me, it's more interesting than, you know, I've worked with every kind of configuration of musicians just about, you know. Like, yeah, of course. You know, gamelan bands or electronic bands, but big orchestras, you know. So it got kind of, I was looking for something new, and it was kind of fun because it was kind of like my basement project I could do. If you're working on a film and you're like, I have to not think about somebody else's film for about three hours. So you, so I could go downstairs and I could build one of these things and and uh, start. And, and now I've got like, I don't know, a dozen with about four or five more in the works. I, I, the latest one is all um, old foghorns, like this. They That's look the like one, this. yeah, okay. Can so, I'll, um, how do we describe that to the So I've 18 of those where I, I built a mechanical uh, you know, depressor that'll push down on that back pedal. But, and then I tuned them all so they each have their own note. Mm -hmm. Fuck, it sounds great. I'd love they're to hear so it. Amazing, yeah. So there. Have you used so? What have you used them on? Any of the scores? I haven't anything? done anything with this yet. Okay. I've, I'm only still just writing some things for it. And um, I got one downstairs. I think we could turn on. I think it'll turn on. Writing for, and that's just for you, just for music, for yourself. Just for or, me, for my own. For your own pleasure. Yeah, believe it or not, sometimes. Well, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm interested because I guess you're sort of. Most of the time, doing scores for for people. Yeah. Obviously, you enjoy it. You yeah, wouldn't you wouldn't yeah. be still doing it, but yeah, what's what's for you then? What what sort of? Well, music. Is, I mean, I think I'm in a good. If you have to be in in the film business, mm -hmm. I don't really want to be a director. I don't like the way they get treated, and I don't like what it means to be a director these days in Hollywood. Okay. You know, it's like... Um, have, have you seen it change a lot over the years or it's yeah. sort of always been... I mean, I think outside of Hollywood, it's getting better and it's more like what it used to be in some ways. Okay. I think technology has made it so that the tools are more accessible to more and more people, yeah. which is amazing. I mean, I think this is such a good time to be a kid right now and be an artist. It's very true. Oh, man. I, I'm so jealous of my kids. You know, it's like... <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you must have, you've struggled with every instrument and now they're just all available on the computer for everyone at all times, whereas you probably 
having what well, been doing it since the seventies, have sort of acquired all of the real versions of everything. Well, I I, um, I love using all the synth stuff that's available and all the computer instruments. But, yeah. But you know, a lot of a lot of instruments you can't really duplicate that sound on on you know electronically, even with samples. You know, even with samples, it's not really the same because that's just a a uh, still snapshot of one moment in time. I agree. I'm, in the I'm life you, of a yeah. French horn, you know. Of course. Where a French horn player, during the day, I mean, I work with French horn players on all my films, and I watch them, like, if somebody comes in, you, if somebody comes in, and I, I watch them to make sure they don't have colds or that they're sick, because they're the ones that, I find, I think horn players have, have the hardest time instantly duplicating music written on paper. Okay. I mean, there's probably about a thousand people in the world that can do that properly. Maybe not even that. We were counting them up, and uh, <laughs> I had um, I, other people I was talking to were saying that they think it's more like six or seven hundred people that can really do it in the whole world. It's like if, if you've got you, a few go-to people that you like to use, obviously. I'm I'm uh, particularly in favor of uh, London's. Uh, Symphony. I have an orchestra over there that I've worked with for sure. 15 years. Wow, okay. And I mostly work at Abbey Road, uh -huh. or sometimes there, but it's a little bit smaller. So uh, when you're doing animation films, you need that extra space, you know, it's like, or like a Marvel film, like when I did Thor, you need the bigger room because you're going to have maybe close to 100 people in that room. And air is good up to about the end of the 70s. And then 80 is too many people in that, in that room. It's just a church, you know. It's like it wasn't built to have, you know, 90 musicians, you know, blasting away. Wow. When was the first time you sort of wrote something and got that many people to be performing it for you? That must be quite the thrill when you first sort of yeah. end up in that room where you've made something just in your brain and then yeah. suddenly there's 100 people working on it with you. Um, I was in, you know, it was, with, you know, with... I came out here with Devo, yeah, and my intention was to, you know, to see how far we could take Devo, you know, to see how far it was going to go. And are we recording yet? Yeah, yeah, of oh, course. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. And so my intention was to, um, you know, and the same with the other guys. We were saying, you know, we know we could be like the weirdo band from Akron, Ohio, and live there and like put out, you know, a record for our fans once a year and mm -hmm. uh, we'd be like the, the Akron, Ohio versions of The Residence or Der Plan from Germany or something like that, yeah, you okay. know? Of course. And we thought, but we think what we're doing it could be bigger than that. And so we thought, well, let's just go right into the belly of the beast. And that's what brought us out here. Cause, um, so how long have you been, you been in LA for? Since 78. Right, okay, yeah. long well, time. Lived here since 78. And um, so, you know, there's a, you know, bands have like a, you know, they have a lifespan. Of course. You know, you want to think a band could be forever. And, you know, for people that, like, I don't know who, when you were a kid, your favorite artist, maybe it was Morrissey, or maybe it was uh, uh, um, Iggy Pop, or maybe it was um, Black Sabbath. I don't know, you know, but I'm saying... Whatever the music was when you were a kid and, and you're, you're, try, you're going, oh my God, uh, what's the, I thought when I became an adult things would make sense, but now things are even <laughs> more fucked up. And then you're going through that puberty, you're going through puberty and you're going through a realization that, that the world, there aren't these big clues that you're going to eventually get by the time you leave high school or something. I thought, that's what we were, I thought you were going to give me the answers today yeah. from Mark. That's why I came here. Well, of course, we all know that de-evolution is... Uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyhow, so, so I, everybody has this music that they attach to. You know? mm -hmm. For me, it's like... Yeah, what were the ones for, for, for you for when you uh, were that age? The I have to say it was the Beatles and the Rolling Stones when I was a little kid. Yeah. That made me want to play music because I had been taking piano lessons since I, I was uh, seven. 
and I hated it. I thought music was invented to torture me. I thought, <laughs> fuck, Mrs. Fox. She, Mrs. Fox, that's the one? She came over and she sang along out of tune. Can you, you know, yeah, tell me a little more about Mrs. Fox? Okay, it was $2 a lesson. Right. So she'd come over, and for $2, she'd sit with me for, a, I don't know how long. It felt like it was for five hours. But Were your parents sort of making you do this? Yeah. Right. Because they had this little you know, keyboard in the, in the house, and they wanted the kids to learn something, you know, and so they thought, well, Mark should learn how to play. this man. So um, she'd come over, and she would sing along with the music I was playing, and my family would be in the next room, and we didn't have a big house, you know, we, we had five kids, and we had like three be- bedrooms, you know, in the house, so it was a pretty packed place, and they'd be sitting in the living room trying to watch TV, and I would turn, I would play as loud and as slow as I could, you know. And I knew that Mrs. Fox would be sitting next to me going, Bone, sweet bone, <laughs> out of tune, you know. And, and I'd just go, they're going to let me quit now. And I, this is going to be the last week I ever do this. And they'd just turn the TV up louder and they'd all huddle around it. Uh, so Mrs. Fox, yeah, she, and then it wasn't until I saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and it was like, because we have five kids, the only way my dad could keep everybody calm at the table at dinner time is he'd put a little tiny portable black and white TV, set it on the TV on one end, and we'd all be like, <laughs> and we'd be watching this show called Ed Sullivan, which was a variety show. Yeah, another one. And, you know, he'd go, okay, we have the Chinese plate spinners, and now it's time for... Topo Gigio, and it was a little puppet, you know, and and then uh, and then he go and now appearing from Liverpool, the Beatles. I had no idea what it was, and they came out and they played. So you saw that when it was on at the time, because that, that yeah. that's a, b- a big moment in music, isn't it? That sort of that was a very big moment. Yeah, in music. yeah. It was like it was for them. It was like they went from just being a sensation in Europe, and you know. England was kind of ahead in a lot of ways, you know, and so it went from being that to being massive once it got to the U.S. That, that, that's like the big, stupid, lumbering giant that, that everybody <laughs> tries to, they want to get their music on radio in, in America because that means you could actually make some money doing of course. it. But, but to see them on TV, they're, and they're playing I Want to Hold Your Hand, and I was, it just gave me goosebumps, and I went, that's why I've been tortured for the last five years of my life, <laughs> learning how to play keyboard. So, so I. But does I it make it, you want to switch to guitar, or because there's well, no keyboards in that? Band I, I ran to Woolworths and bought sheet music, and uh, for Hard Day's Night. And my right. friend who played accordion, he came over, and um, we started rehearsing every night after school. And um, we had an organ in our house, a little home organ. It was sad thing and I'd be playing that and he'd be playing accordion and we'd be going it's been a hard day 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 and I and after about four or five of those rehearsals I got this sick feeling in my stomach and I realized I had spent my whole life learning the wrong instrument I was totally I was totally destroyed I could not fucking believe it and so it's like two weeks later and and Ed Sullivan goes, okay, and the Beatles are back again. And they came out and they did, uh, I think it was Help. Sure. Okay. So they came back two weeks later, did they? Something like that. Yeah, right. It was right. pretty close. Yeah. And uh, I just remember hearing about the one time I don't remember. And I was just like, my for, eyes are welling up with more. tears. I'm like, no, why did <laughs> You should have been the, guitar. That's where I, I should have been. Why didn't I ever? I don't know. And I just, you know, I was just sitting there feeling sorry for myself. And then, you know, and then they put two, they put the band in, in, in his shows. He'd put the bands at the beginning and then at the end. So you'd stay all the way to the end of the show. Good trick. And so I'm waiting for the end of the show and, uh, they come back on, and he goes, okay, and the Beatles are back playing. And I, it was the B-side, I think, of um, Hard Day's Night. I think, it was, I think it was Hard Day's Night, and the B-side was um, uh, I'm Down. Okay. And so, so the, I've seen them three times now. You know, the fr- first two times they were on, mm-hmm. you know, one song, one song, and I've seen three songs performed, and then this is the fourth song. But something's wrong. There's something wrong, because where it was like 
three guys standing up and one guy sitting down at the drums. Now there's only two guys standing up with guitars and one guy sitting down at what looks like a card table. And I'm like, what's going on? And they come in closer and it's John Lennon and he's sitting at a card table. And uh, I'm like, what is that about? And then they go to a solo and it's something called a Vox Continental portable organ. Never heard of that. Never saw it. And it was small and compact and it was badass looking and the most insane thing about it was that it had black and white keys and uh, the black keys were white and the white keys were black. Whoa. And I looked at that and I go, oh my God, <laughs> only the Beatles could find a keyboard that had where the, key, where the colors were reversed. Like I thought that was insane. <laughs> it blew my mind just to look at that. And then he started doing a solo and I knew nothing about Jerry Lee Lewis or, or Little Richard or, or any of those guys. So when he in the said, middle, when he Fox. starts banging on the keys and then he starts going like this with his elbow, I'm thinking, Mrs. Fox never told me you could play with, a, <laughs> you, know, you, could play with your elbow. And I, I just remember calling up my accordion player friend afterwards and going, the Beatles used an organ, they didn't use an organ. So I bugged the living shit out of my parents until it took them a year and a half or something before they finally got me a little inexpensive Italian Farfisa organ yep. that I, so I could join bands. And so by the time I was 13, I was already in bands trying to make my own music. So you sort of, because your, your compositions are, very elaborate and that's all you know because I was just thinking watching Devo you're I never see you touching anything so m most of the time you're just singing and performing in that way I wasn't sure what, sort of how you started out with with learning music that's so. what first got me into it and then um, uh, I kind of went to college by accident I got a a partial not art, art college right not, not yeah I got a partial uh, scholarship because I had won some local, some local thing uh, that my teacher had put a piece of my art in this art show, and, and it won. And so there was this Kent State. I'm sure they don't even do it anymore, but they used to do this thing where kids that showed signs of talent, but they, they it looked like they weren't going to go to college. They would offer them these like, like a like a as a lure, a partial scholarship. Okay. And so they lured you. that I could figure out how to do a, a job in the evening and pay the balance. And it sounded so much better than going to Vietnam to me. <laughs> oh, my Lord, I, I didn't even I mean, think I had, that. I had been thinking, I can't think, of one, I can't think of one Vietnamese person I would like to kill. I, I, right, so that was an option potentially for you. Oh, yeah, and you were watching wow, it on yeah, TV. It was very graphic. It was Ooh, like yes. if I wasn't a student and us two deferment, I would be A1, you know, I'd be a, an A1 ready to go, ready wow. to go grab a gun and, and shoot people. And I just thought, there's no way, I can't shoot anybody, I can't think of a <laughs> single person, I, there was nobody I disliked, I said, what if Hitler was alive? I would, well, knowing what I know, I would probably point him out to somebody so they could shoot him, but <laughs> I don't know if I could shoot him. I wasn't, I didn't think I could shoot anybody, and so I thought, well, I don't want to do that. So I went to school, and it was a total life changer for me yeah. to all of a sudden be around the world of art, and um, I, I became like a, I, I, you know, what Shepard Ferry later did a, an amazing job of, you know, pasting up his his Obey stickers. I, I used to paste up my artwork in 1968 and 1969. There was no such thing as graffiti art back then, but I used to do my own version of it because I found out all the other kids would leave school at 3.30 and when the bell rang and they'd run to their dormitories and their fraternity houses or wherever and go to the bar and party. And I had the whole art department to myself, so I, I mean, I didn't have to stand in a queue every time I wanted to burn a screen and print a screen, I could print a whole piece of art in one night. And then at three in the morning on the way back to home, or if I just slept there, I could just walk around campus and I could put my artwork up uh, wow, cool. over top of things. You know, and like what was I, sort of the, the drive, where was the drive for this coming from? Is it just sort of always in you? There's sort of an obsession there? I think so. I always wanted to be an artist because when, uh, 
I went through first and second grade being legally blind, and nobody knew it. So I always got in trouble for being an asshole. You know, it was like, <laughs> it's like um, the teacher would go, okay, add up the numbers on the board, you know, in, in second grade. And I'd go, what's a board? And everybody would start laughing, and then I'd they'd go, all right, young man, in the corner. And I go, how do people know the right answers for this stuff? You know, I just really couldn't figure out how everybody... And then they tested me and found out I couldn't see the big E from, like, this far away. So, right. So, but I'd, somehow I'd managed to walk to school every day and uh, sit in my, go through my classes, but just wasn't very successful. But, but um, I got a pair, fitted with a pair of, of glasses that gave me 20-20 vision, and... That must have been quite a game changer for me. That was amazing because it <laughs> yeah, happened in, in like, an, in, in a matter of five minutes. I went from putting these on to like things were in focus I'd never seen before. I'd never seen my dad before except for unless I was this close to him because uh, I could only see six inches away, uh, up to six inches away, and then I lost my vision. And uh, I could see, I recognized him from you know, like six feet away, and I'm like, that's dad. And, what is all the stuff in this office? And then we went outside, and the medical office was on the hill right above my elementary school. And as I remember going down that hill and looking over and seeing my school for the first time that I'd gone to for two years. Wow. And I saw houses with a roof. I'd never seen a real roof before or seen a chimney with smoke. How old did you say again this was? You were... I was seven then. Right. And so... I, I, you know, I saw trees for the first time. That was incredible because I. That's I knew, a long time to have not really yeah, seen anything. Yeah, seven years is a long time it. to go, yeah. and uh, but it was like for me, it was such a joyful thing because I saw the top part of the tree with the leaves and everything, and I saw clouds. I'd never seen a cloud before. So when I went to school the next day, I'm so ex excited. And I'm drawing, and I drew a picture of a tree, and the teach my teacher who had been um, spanking me, because corporal punishment was popular in the 50s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> She'd been spanking me, and, um, oh, the, yeah, it's still the 50s. No, yeah, it was still the 50s, the end of the 50s. And um, putting me in the corner and sending me to the principal's office, she was looking over my shoulder, and she said, you draw trees better than me. And that, it just stuck in my head. Uh, I could not believe it. It's like the first nice thing a school teacher had ever said to me, <laughs> other than like, shut up, sit down. Yeah, behave I can't yourself. imagine it was nice in those, those And days I went at home all. that night and dreamt I was going to be an artist. And so, so I was, visual art was my obsession. And I didn't care about anything else. I just wanted to draw and to paint and to do things like that. And then the Beatles kind of opened yeah, that up for swung me. swung you in another direction. And, you know, and then I remember buying the single satisfaction and I brought it home and it was because you know you'd it was a 45 you'd play it and then as soon as it was over you started it again and then as soon as it was over you'd start again you'd maybe the first day maybe I'd listen to it 60 times when was the last time you did that with the song recent any, any time in the last 10 years mm, not that many times no. no it stops happening doesn't it nothing kind of gets you in the same yeah. way yeah but somewhere in the middle of playing that, sitting on the floor and playing that on a little portable 45 yeah. player, this woman from my mom's church came over, was over at the house, and she looks up and she goes, to my mom, she goes, Mary, why do you let that boy listen to that song? That's dirty. Wow. And then I went to the basement, and I'm sitting there listening to it a hundred times more going, <laughs> what does that mean? It's dirty. What's the dirty part? I can't get no satisfaction. I can't... I don't understand. What's the dirty part? I could not figure it out. But it made me look that, like the song even more <laughs> that it made uh, some woman from my mom's church upset. The church, of course. And to this day, it's still, to me, I think it's one of... I, I think... I know Mick Jagger gets credit for so many things, but I think he's... I think of his poetry as easily um, more impressive than a uh, Bob Dylan to me. I think right, the, yeah, sure. I think his his writing uh, was incredible, and especially in that time period, you know, it's like everybody loses it after a while when you're in a band. It's bands, you know, you you can keep them going, you know, like keep pumping it up artificially, but bands do have a have a yeah, trajectory. no, that's they're such a funny one. You kind of 
the the blueprint, I guess, for what it is to be the longest running successful band that there is. But they sort yeah. of don't make it look so good <laughs> anymore. Yeah, people love to still go and see them. I just don't know. Well, I understand that. Because as long as they're willing to play, you know, the old stuff. Yeah. You know, of course, we'll have to listen to something from the new album that they're trying to sell, and they can't figure out why nobody goes crazy for the new album. But, but you know, it's like, it's. I think it just has to do with when you listen to a band. That's what I was trying to say earlier. It's like, you know, you can attach yourself to any piece, of, any band, any piece of music can be the one that's important to you. For me, it was those first couple Beatles songs and uh, and uh, Rolling Stone things, and then. Later on, it became things, some things Brian Eno did and, and uh, um, Captain Beefheart for sure. Yeah, and, okay. uh, there was a lot of artists that, that, that it became more people that, that were important. But, uh, um, you know, I think it could be something as stupid as like, uh, you know, muskrat love for somebody, which I hope it isn't, but, you know, it could be. You know, it could be something that it just happened to when you your life was upside down and you were trying to make sense of what it meant to be a human on this planet. You know, so, so music, you, you know, you look to the, to the music that's on the radio or that you're listening to somewhere and you go, and you music helps you, you attach meaning to it and an importance to yeah, certain absolutely. things. And, and it helps you... It, it, and it, and, it, and it becomes embedded on your head, you know. It becomes embedded in your head, and it's something that that's almost Pavlovian. And it's, you know, because there is so much music now, it's it's less people picking all the same songs, but, you know. That's true. It's definitely, But yeah. that's kind of okay, too, because, God, what did they do before? They all picked Amazing Grace at one time, so <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> <laughs> or... Or some, you know, something they heard in church, or or some military song, or something. You yeah. Know? So, so it's, so I don't know. I think it's kind of. I don't know why we digress down that doesn't direction, matter. but <laughs> it doesn't matter. You did a cover of "Can't Get No Satisfaction," huh? That was was that one of the first ones Devo did? Yeah, it was like. Uh, I think that's the. Well, it wasn't the first cover we did. The first cover. Well, the first cover wasn't really a cover. It was an appropriation of. A chorus. I wrote all. I wrote this song called "Secret Agent Man," but it had nothing to do with the Johnny Rivers song except I used the words "Secret Agent Man," "Secret Agent Man." They've given you a number and taken away your name. So that was all it took for for him to own the whole song. Then is that right? So what you could you sort of That's end up in works. a law suit with them, or so he so so. But you know, it's like um. That was the first thing we did, and then the second one was, and Satisfaction was kind of because it was 1974, and the song was 10 years old, and we thought, this is the best song in rock and roll, and it needs to be, it needs to be reinterpreted for the 70s. It's definitely reinterpreted. It so that's definitely kind of very we Devo doing, as well. Know, we were, and, and it didn't start off that way. It was totally organic, and it was had to do. We were like rehearsing in a frozen. Um, uh, car wash where they gave us this one back room okay. where, where all the they kept the soap and everything that w- they would let us set up and there would be nobody there in the winter so you know it was perfect time to to rehearse there because we could make as much noise as we wanted and nobody nobody was coming to a car wash when there's icicles hanging out of the out of the <laughs> you know the sprinklers you know at the car wash so um you know Bob Casale was freezing and he played that da, 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 da. that's how it started with that and. And then Alan put this strange beat on it that... It's got a strange beat, yeah. yeah it and, sort of flips the other way. I like, I like yeah, that about and, it. Uh, the pieces all just kind of came in organically, and it made us laugh, so we, we kept doing it. <laughs> and you play, You guys did a show earlier this year, is that right? Yeah. I watched that one on, on the YouTube with Fred mm, Armisen yeah. on the drums. I'm trying not to... I, for me, it's hard to do that stuff anymore because of my ears. It's because like, of your ears? My ears, yeah. Right. It's like, because I'm screaming for, you know, an hour and a half or so, you know, and and my ears ring really loud, and then I have to be back at work the next day, you know, and I can't hear hi-hats or, or flutes or piccolos, so 
I let uh, the other guys mix for a week until everything calms down again. Oh, so it takes that long for you yeah, to, it does. to readjust. Yeah, so, sure. So it's like, uh, so I try not to do shows, and then... It must be fun, though, getting back with the gang. It's fun with the, the you know, the 90 miniature on stage. You know, other than that, it's like all these, like, older citizens that are crabby at this point, and they're all like... Um, <laughs> You know, and they're all just figuring out how to get from point A to point B, and then you know you get over to the the show, and then you do the show, and then you're like packing up to get ready to go to point C, you know. And, and so you don't you don't miss the the being in a band part. Touring of... was was kind of fun, you know, but it's like a really great job for twenty year olds, you know. Yeah. It's kind of like you shouldn't be doing it when. But you're in your 40s or 50s. So when did you guys stop in, you started this at, what, 80, 89? Did I say? started this in like 84. 84, uh, okay. Yeah. The internet It was kind of like, you know, we'd done six albums at that point where we'd, you know, you write 12 songs, rehearse them, mm -hmm. record them, make a video, make an album cover, make, do all the artwork and everything for that, and then do the video and come up with choreography for a live show and rehearse a show and do a stage set and then go on tour. And then by the time you get back home, it's a year later, and then you write 12 more songs. Do it takes it three again. months and you do it again. And we did it like six times in a row. And, and um, a friend of mine, uh, Paul Rubin, said, will you score my TV show? And it was called Pee Wee's Playhouse. And uh, I said, yeah. And... Um, he was located in New York at the time, and I was here in L.A., so he would send me a tape on Monday. On Tuesday, I would write 12 songs worth of music. On Wednesday, I'd record it. Thursday, I had to put tapes in the mail and send them to New York. Friday, they would cut it into the, wow. the program, and Saturday, we watched it on TV, <laughs> and then Monday, I got another tape, and I was like, sign me up for this job. This is amazing i get to write an album every week that to me sounded so much more interesting than you know getting to write one album and then go on tour so and also sort of writing it all by yourself more than anything or were you oh, yeah. you're working with the other guys in the band at that point well or? uh i tried doing a couple we tried doing a couple movies where we had the whole band but it didn't work because they that you're on time schedules you know and you don't you can't spend like if you have 80 pieces of music you have to write for a movie you can't spend a week on one piece of music going you know I'm thinking maybe we should try it this way you know like you would with a song and so when we were about two weeks away from having to turn the whole movie in I just said okay I just stayed all night and I wrote you just got the whole it. film yeah, sure. in the next two weeks and we did a couple of those and I thought I'm not going to do it that way anymore and then that's when um, Paul Rubin's asked me to score for him and and um the other guys were all kind of they were they they weren't that interested in writing for tv or film and um so they all kind of you went off other and did other went other directions and you know and uh i just kind of doubled down the Pee Wee show was was a hit and then i did a couple other shows Soon after that, that were hits and yeah, and Rugrats. Uh, I used to watch. Yeah, watch Rugrats. That when I was a kid. Rugrats. So that's a classic tune. That one, the theme well, song. Well, that's an example that. of something where I thought I was never going to get to work with an orchestra, but uh, Rugrats. I, you know, after about three years of writing all this music in a in the second bedroom of my house, you know, I had this other two bedrooms, and I was in the second bedroom. I had a studio, and after about three years, I got told, well we're going to make a feature film. I go, that's great. And they go, would you score the movie for us? And I go, I would love to. And, so and that's I'd, the first sort of big, big thing that you've done where you sort of start incorporating. That was the first and, one with a big orchestra. Yeah. And, uh, was that slightly terrifying, exciting? What? At first I was a little nervous and then I realized it was easier than, than doing what I had been doing because I could write up my sketches, and then you have orchestrators that you give them to. And so then, that's, that's how it works. You get orchestrators yeah, and so, to, to help you. So it's like, that. I'm writing it here, but then it's other people that, that take it and put it on the paper for 90 players. They're the nice. ones that go, 
You know that uh, flute line you wrote, Mark? Somewhere around uh, C flat, it's going to turn into a piccolo. Is that okay? Because uh, flutes don't play I above that note. I was wondering about and this. I go, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, and so sure, they okay. they protected me. You know, yeah. they they protected me and helped me with my own. You, know, you must. So with that happening, though, as the years have gone by, you must have gotten better and better at now. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. understanding that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah, and I've done it all myself on some things, and uh, yeah. but a lot can be said about a good orchestrator. Yeah, yeah. Everybody uses. I mean, they used orchestrators in all the films in the past. If you look, the orchestrators used to have a more prominence in the credits back in the old days in movies, and then. They just moved way down. Once all the special effects people and everything, so many people have their names on film credits now that the orchestrators are just down there and the, the right. crawl in the back. But. Yeah, because they're obviously a huge, a huge part of it. Because that is, I mean, I was wondering about that sort of the step from listening to, to Devo and earlier stuff they've done and then suddenly these ginormous strings and everything coming in. I'm like, I mean, I knew you'd, you're very good at the piano. Well, I was writing in. Oh, there's nothing. <laughs> I, I, I was writing using pads, you know, for TV because they didn't have the budget for a, yeah. for an orchestra, and that's that was that's why they were going to me because they were. I was at the cutting edge of when MIDI came in. Yeah. And uh, people who were around for that, it's like um, all of a sudden the studios went, "How can we save?" you know, $100,000 on a season of Flintstone shows. Oh, I see. Don't hire the orchestra of, of 30 people wow. once a week for that, yeah. 13 weeks. So, you know, Cause they, did they would go, they'd days. hire me and they go, that sounds good enough to us, you know. So <laughs> then they'd, they'd let me do it and uh, I was taking work away from... Uh, but then you've bought it back as the years have gone by. Well, yeah. Well, yes and no, because TV still... There are some TV shows that they still spend still the money using... for an orchestra, but most of the time not. Mostly they. Do they you just kind of bluff your way through it with a, a handful of string players and then fluff it out with some backing strings from the? You can, yeah, and you can. There's all sorts of tricks. Yeah, you know? of it's like bringing in like three or four string players to play over top of something, and and it gives that a little bit of a human feel to it. And there's such good samples now. Uh, and it's all valid, you know. You can make an awesome sounding score using one synth, you know. People have done it. Uh, I wanted to work with Taika Watiti, the, uh, the know, yeah. New Zealand From director, New Zealand, yeah, of course, because right. his film right before mine, uh, Hunt for the Wilder People. Great film. Hilarious. Oh, I, love, I love that movie. Used, so Kiwi as well. He used all this like early 70s, like uh, Jean-Michel Jarre and Jan Hammer and stuff like that. He used all this old... And he's got those Phoenix Foundation guys working Yeah, it was like too. a really simplistic synth sound, but somehow juxtaposing that against um, cold Amazon New Zealand outback was an amazing... It was an amazing layering. It was really... And I was just like, that's really smart. That's what I remember sitting in the theater at first being kind of like, this is doesn't work and then after about three minutes I went oh he's a genius that's that's what it is and so that's that's how come that's did you I track him there. down for that film no he, it he... was a pure miracle it's like I saw the film and then like two or three weeks later I got a call from um, Marvel uh, Disney and they said uh, that this guy Taika Watiti he only has one choice for a composer and he wants you to do it very cool and uh, they want to know if I'd come in and meet him. So that must have been fun. He seems like I a did. fun, it went, it a fun went guy. Great, yeah, yeah. That's that's but that's a very big. That's all strings and kind of elaborate, isn't it? The the that's thought. gigantic. Score, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like there was a lot of good stuff about it. But I but I also it's like he and I we both tried to push it a lot further. And Marvel they they I imagine that credit, would be yeah yeah a difficult. To their credit, they bring in, uh, you know, talented people that oftentimes haven't, you know, had experience before with something that their size. But on the other side, they do know what they want their aesthetic to be. So it has to be. They kind of hug you in, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I think them getting... we were trying to go like this, you know. And... Well, I, it, it definitely with him directing it and just the feel of that movie, it definitely is quite different. So I'm sure you know it, it did sort of go slightly. 
off in a different direction. I hope he does his director's uh, cut someday. He right. Has a, he has a, a cut that's about 50 minutes longer, and he got these performances out of Jeff Goldblum and um, <laughs> uh, Anthony Hopkins that are over the top. To, and he, he elaborated on it and had he let them just go off on these crazy tangents. It must have been so fun. It was really good. And then really good. the disenchantment thing as well. I really enjoyed that. That was great. Oh, okay. Yeah. How did that I, one come about? Um, well, I, Matt called up, but I, I've known him since the late 70s, 80s. We were kind of in this, there was like a artist scene in... L.A. Uh huh. So long. So it'd be like Pee Wee was part of it, and you know they're, you know, so we we knew each other. Some Gary Panter and people like that, and so we knew each other and hung out. And uh, this is a podcast. Yes. Where does it go out? Uh, everywhere. Shit. Was there things you can't say? Well, I'd tell you the, uh, a really good backstory with Matt, Please. but I'll have to save it. I can't really do it. Okay, tell me afterwards. Okay, I'll tell you. Tell me, tell me the story you can tell me now. <laughs> that he's enjoyable to work with, and... Um, <laughs> right. He is. Yeah, he's sure. Really, uh, I, really, uh, I really like him, and I like his, his crew. He's, like, assembled these people, you know, after years and years in animation, you know, yeah, well, even just the, the voices and uh, all the voice actors and everything, it's all the same people as Futurama and everything, it seems like. It's got so, this similar So, yeah, feel. so I've enjoyed working with him, and uh, it's a, we'll see what happens. I mean, it's not The Simpsons, that's for sure, but it, but it, is, a funny, it is a funny show. I found and it really funny. I really enjoyed it. If you hang in there it. for about three or four episodes, yeah. no, it, I starts did. To, it starts to make sense. Yeah, I, I it for, definitely did. Took a little bit to get to know There's the characters. There's a lot of exposition in the first episode or two, and, and it feels contrived, but it gets much better. Back to this devolution theory. <laughs> yes. th th thoughts as the years have gone by. I wouldn't call it a theory anymore. <laughs> I think it's been proven it's, at this point. Unfortunately for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Are you um, a optimistic or pessimistic guy about sort of the way things are going? Well, Devo were al always optimists, but I do have to say, devolution is happening faster than we predicted, <laughs> and uh, we're at, at a bizarre place right now and and I worry about it because I think because I, I keep wanting to think oh well this is everyone's got to see now the kind of things we have to change you mm -hmm. know you'd, you'd think it would unify people but it doesn't people are bifurcated even more and they're comp confused and and like it's easy to confuse them it's like the internet confuses them and uh Sound bites confuse them, and everything confuses people now. It's kind of crazy. Well, there's just so much, I guess, and from so many different angles that it, it's hard to know what's really going on a little bit. At least there used to be one solid lie that <laughs> maybe might not be true. Well, but well, now it's like it's now it's like the log has been lifted up. You feel like the log's really been lifted up, and there's vermin scrambling everywhere, <laughs> and it seems like nobody cares. It's, it's like they, I can, yeah, they, I, they voted Kavanaugh in today, I think. Uh, there, there has to be a second vote to cement it in about, I don't know if that clock's right, but yeah, in an hour and a half or something, our time. Uh, but they voted 51 to 49 in favor of him becoming... Who is it, Kavanaugh? Uh, I, don't, I don't follow any of oh, this stuff. I stay, the, I stay out of all of it. Justice that, that's been accused of uh, rape by a by more than oh, one person okay. who, who was much more credible than him. And he screamed and threw a tantrum and proved that he was not, um, he was not uh, you know, evenly weighed between, um, you know, uh, political parties. He's like very partisan, uh, Republican, mm -hmm. anti-Democrats. And, 
He did so many things in his hearing last week that you said, oh, there's no way anybody could vote for him. He's crazy. And yeah, that's what we always say. And <laughs> they're still still getting the vote. Yeah. Do you have any sort of, what would be your advice to people then on how to sort of make the world a better place? Do you have any ideas? What do we do? Um, what do you do? Is there things you like to do? I think people have to choose their mutations carefully. Okay. I think they have to not get tricked into, into just taking the path, path of least resistance. You know, mm -hmm. I think people have to say, okay, it's really worth it to stand up for what I believe in and to, and to make good decisions, you know. Uh, that's all. Yeah, that's, you know? that's, that's, that's definitely. All. I think you just have to know why you're for or against something, and it has to be more than just, you know, you're repeating something that a, a TV star said to you or something. <laughs> you know, you, it has to be something that is grounded in something that, that makes sense. Yeah. What do you sort of want people to take away from what you do? Is there sort of a message behind it or, you know, an ethic that, that's driven you? Well, I, you know, I think, um, and here goes that word again, uh, I think you should em embrace your mutations. I think I did. I think uh, uh, the things, rather than looking at, you know, like, you're gone now, you know, and rather than looking at my lack of, uh, uh, you know, focus with my eyeballs, uh, um, I, th I think I've, I've looked for the things that came with that that, that might have given me something special. And I, th I think that's, that's what people need to do instead of like saying, oh, I could never be as good as Arnold Schwarzenegger uh -huh. or whoever, you know, whoever they Just think Just be the is, best you. Capitalize yeah, and, on what it is that makes and, you your, yourself. And, yeah, and be sensitive enough to understand what it is about yourself that is special and that is, would be worthy of sharing with the world, you know, because uh, everybody's got something. Yeah. What are, what are, your, what are your things? What would you, you say is, is your, your special quality? Do you think about it or um, are you just sort of well, so you know, in the middle of it that you... I, I, I use my... my um, I use my, uh, my, uh, my problems. Like, uh, I have a little bit of dyslexia. If you rattle off your telephone number and you add the area code in at the beginning, 10 numbers in a row is too much for me to remember. <laughs> I can't, I will never get them exactly right. But I found out where that serves me well is when a client says, I want a piece of music that sounds a little bit like, uh, you know, this Mozart uh, magic flute theme right here. I want it to sound something like that. I can like listen to the Mozart Magic Flute theme and instead of playing it exactly the same, I change it, I change things up kind of not even purposely or unpurposely. Right, yeah, I of make course. I make um I make mute my own mutation of it and um and they go, Oh that sounds pretty good. I mean I think that's um I think that's was like a well, not just him, but I think Wes Anderson. I think that was the key to our success together. Is that? Is that? I love those scores. Yeah, we Wes could was. talk about things, and and I was kind of looking for um, a contemporary classical sound, like a new tradition, you know, a new traditionalist kind of sound with him. I was, I was, I wanted to write pieces where you went. That sounds like I. Sounds like something I've heard many times, but yet it was something new. So, so. I like the in the Life Aquatic the drum machine tune, the little just when they're, when oh, they're yeah. I can't remember what it was called. I was listening to it today, but that one's that one's great. And then there's some really nice harp at the end of the Royal Tenenbaums. I think there's some yeah, some beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, great. Great stuff in there. So what, just they, they come to you with sort of a bit of an idea of what they want you to make it sound like? Yeah, they, they have, um, yeah, it's their film, you know, and they've thought about it for maybe five years or so before they got to make it, and they have things in their head or they've put temp music down along with it, and it's not exactly right, but it's kind of, 
close, you know, or, or it's in the right. And, and um, for me, I like to collaborate. So, so it's like I enjoy, like, talking with people and sizing up what they say. You know, like if, if they say, I want this to be uh, a little more active or I, or I want the scene seems slow or the actors don't look like they're really in love or, or this has to be really a dangerous moment. In the film, this is the most dangerous moment in the film and it doesn't look like it the way we shot it. So I need help, you know. And so, right, and you pull and that so, emotion out with the, so you, with the you, music. So you know, I like... And some people are less articulate. Some people, they, they go like, I just needed to have kind of like a blue feel to it. Like if it was kind of like it was blue, that would be, you know, or they don't, they don't know what they're, you they must don't know how to good, say it. And they feel like, these people. they go, I'm sorry I can't be more articulate. I go, you're being perfectly articulate. That's, that's much better for me than, than telling me, you know, a certain, certain uh, Italian phrases that, that uh, are kind of just as meaningless. Does this have a sort of an end point for you? Oh, you, you're just happy just always working? Do you sort of feel like there'll be a point when you'd retire, hang up your hat, and that's enough? Or art's always going to be kind well, of... Well, personally, I would like to morph more into museums. I, I was... Because of, uh, of um, record companies, like, you know, I... I, sign, I got my band to sign with Virgin Records and Richard Branson, even though right. Warner Brothers already kind of... Jerry had already told Warner Brothers we would sign with them. But Richard had signed the Sex Pistols, and they were my favorite band in 1977. And uh, he wanted to sign us, and he, we were all the same age. We were in our you know early, mid-20s. And uh, I... You know, I stayed on a houseboat on the Thames with him for two weeks, and he seemed like a cool guy, you know. Um, I didn't know that his plan was to become a billionaire, which meant he was <laughs> going to have to take all of my money. <laughs> so, so you know, but... And then we had just other experiences, like with record companies, where it just was... It left a foul taste in our mouth and left us disappointed, you know, where we were like, wow, this is really shittier than we thought it was going to be. And so... When it came to, and I'd been showing art in galleries before Devo, and then the Devo thing kind of really took over everything for about five or eight years, ten years. And then when I started showing my art again, I, by that point I knew people that owned the biggest galleries in this town because they were all friends like with Tim Leary, who was yeah. kind of my best pal at one time. We, you know, all the way up to his death. You know, we used to have dinner together a couple times a month. He'd either come to my place or I'd go over to his place. And and he always had parties, so there was always these people you'd meet. And I met all these gallery directors that were big galleries, and, and I had friends that were artists that said, you know, I showed my artwork at this gallery, and Doug ripped me off. He stole all the money, and he, he sold all my paintings and didn't give me anything, and I just thought, Wow, big galleries and museums. It sounds like Warner Brothers and uh, Virgin Records <laughs> yeah. all over again. So, Same thing. So I, I, uh, I started doing shows again, and I did about 125 shows wow. where I went to places like Juxtapose Magazine and went into the back, and they had these ads for 20 bucks, like little galleries all over the world, like a gallery called gray blur or a gallery called um you know what they all had funny names and they were all they were all kids the mo of all these galleries was the same thing it was like a guy or a guy and a girl or two guys just got out of college and they know they're going to have to take a job doing graphic paste up for walmart you know right there in their little hometown but before that they've got enough money they're going to like find a space they could rent in some shitty part of town 
and they're going to put an art gallery up, and they're going to show people of Ypsilla, Michigan, that <laughs> we've got graffiti artists right here in Ypsilla that are just as good as that uh, Banksy or that Shepherd Ferry. We've got guys right here in town that are great that nobody knows about. And so they open up this little place where people that drive Mercedes and BMWs, they're not going to drive their car over to the warehouse district late at night, you know, in Ypsilla. They're going to they're gonna go shop for art downtown at those two fancy galleries where, that have... Uh, you know, like knockoffs of Monet and uh, Pissarro, you know, kind of stuff in the windows. Yeah. And they're going to go buy something for their office there. But so in the mean, so these kids are not even attracting the people that buy art. Instead, they're attracting their friends. And so they get a keg and they get 30 people and a bunch of guys skateboard around inside the <laughs> gallery while they're showing the art and they finish off the keg and they probably don't sell any art or they sell a few pieces and they last for a year or so and then they disappear and I, I started calling these these little galleries and um, and you'd know how old they were because I go um, I'd like to do a show at your gallery and they go who are you and I go I'm Mark Mothersbaugh and they go I know that Na did you write the music for Rugrats <laughs> you know and so you knew that they just got out of college you know you'd know the exact age and we'd talk I'd go yeah I'm the guy who wrote the music for go what are you doing with art and I'd tell him I'd say I was an artist before I was doing music for Rugrats and and I'd have a website where instead of they couldn't really afford to take paintings but I would do prints so I have a printer in the other room now yeah. and I'd I would every day I do art I do visual art every single day of my life and um, always have Always have, yeah. What sort of what sort of things? Just um, I can show you in the other room if you want to see some. Yeah, sure. Okay. But uh, we'll, we'll, after we'll, okay. we'll, we'll keep But rolling. it's uh, because of my vision. It's like I used to always want to work on this format. Well, it started. It had a bunch of reasons. One was because, like, I, I can see twenty twenty. But when I go like this right now. I bend the corners of this room down about 18 inches on each side, and it's even more extreme if you're in a bigger space. Okay. And so when you're working on a, pa a canvas, even if it's only the size of that thing, it's like when you move around, all the perspective changes. And so it's like you have to not move your head and stay in one position while you paint the picture. It's impossible. And, but if you work on something this size, I can do it. And I can hold my perspective, and I could do so. I just got used to drawing on that size. Plus, uh, what was happening at the same time is this was like the late '60s, early '80s, and mail art was really popular. And I found out while I was at Kent State that if I did a piece of art and sent it to Robert, Indiana, or to a number of other people, Jasper Johns. Okay. Or to Irene Dogmatic or to Image Bank, I could send, I could do a piece of artwork on a paper and send it to them, and there was a good chance I would get something in the mail, and it would be me, a nobody, just some kid, some kid that nobody knew who he was. He was just some jerk that, that uh, the other kids beat up when he was in high school every day because I had a invisible kick me sign, and Robert Indiana sent me a piece of art. He did he did some mail art and sent it back to me. All right, so everyone would just send each other. And that was, to me, wow. like this amazing thing. So that kept me making stuff this big. And so I was doing these, and I was mailing them off, and, and I was, we were starting Devo at the same time. And I remember I'd make one, and maybe it would say, Choco Homo, heaven-bound king of animals or something, you know. And um, then I'd have a picture of a, a devil pointing up a up a ladder on the way to heaven, but it would have every horrible thing humans did on every step of the of the way up or something. You know, I'd do some sort of a drawing like that, and I'd mail it off. And then we were working on lyrics, and I was like, oh, maybe I should save these cards because I, some of them had I was writing lyrics and and poems on them, and so I started keeping them instead of mailing them out. And when I got a stack of them, I was like this nerd collector of stamps when I was a little kid. Yeah. Don't collect stamps. They never, <laughs> they never accrue value. It's, no, I don't know. That, so. that was a bad <laughs> investment. But mind. was it fun? But I was, I was kind of into it at one time. And, you know, and so, but I knew that there were these archival 
red binders you could buy for like three bucks mm -hmm. that would hold a hundred of these cards of paper, these little collages, these little paintings, these little drawings that I was doing. I could fit a hundred of them in a book. So every time I did a hundred, which would, if it was one a day or two a day or something, they'd eventually fill it up and then I'd put it in a, on my, on the shelf, on my bookshelf and start uh, collecting those. Now I have, so it's like there, that's, there's a hundred in each one and now, so you zoom ahead to 2018, there's, they aren't all here, but there's probably about a hundred of them in the room next door. There's, I've probably done about close to 500 of these books that each have a hundred drawings and those drawings became uh, an image bank for Devo for, so like the, the idea of freedom of choice uh, was written on a card and had, had uh, something that influenced the video that we made, Freedom of Choice. It had one of the scenes from the video was like, came from a drawing I did of a blindfolded guy trying to choose between a couple of things. And then like uh, the original cover for uh, our first album uh, with Chichi Rodriguez came from, I'd saved this, it was a found image I, I'd found of a uh, golf tees in a pack that, and it yeah, had that. his head in front of a golf ball it cracked me up so much that <laughs> but that was an image that I used in 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 this art in this image bank that I was doing and and uh, so I started saving those and so but I still do them to this day I do them every day and it's like you, do, do you sort of find it hard to do you run out of inspiration or anything with with any of this stuff with the art or with the music or some of them are more inspired than others. Yeah. You can look at them and you can see that there's some of them that are better than others. And then sometimes I go on a, on a spurt where there's like maybe 50 or in, in a row that are awesome. And then there's like some that are just okay, you know. Do you, do you notice what the change and what makes you inspired is or it just... just... It's, sometimes it's just chance. Yeah. Because um, early on I was influenced by... Uh, but even with, Bef with music as well, I'm sort of interested. Yeah, before Devo, I became interested in like the art movements in Europe between World War I and World War II. So I was fascinated with like the Italian futurists for music, of course, because they were like, they made statements in the 20s saying uh, the, the modern orchestra does not is not capable of making the sounds required to accurately depict an industrial world. Right. And so they were adding things like like an electric fan with a cardboard thing in it to go brrrr, and then they'd, uh, they add foghorns. They used foghorns and they would write music with that stuff. And you know that the, the, those Italian futurists, if you could bring those guys back alive mm -hmm. and you could just let them listen to the radio even, they would lose their mind, you know? <laughs> If they walked into a music store now and saw what was available, they yeah, would just go, yeah. oh, fuck, we should have lasted <laughs> another hundred years. Uh, and and then, you know, of course, the Dadaists, you know, were a big influence and, and things like that. But something that happened to me is like uh, somewhere around 69 or 70, um, I got invited to... Uh, something called a full gospel church dinner. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, my girlfriend and I go, free dinner? Okay, <laughs> we can do that. So we went to this thing. It was at a steel workers building in Cleveland. And uh, it's a giant hall, you know, like a, like a giant cafeteria. And they're, you know, they serve food and we're eating dinner. And then afterwards, then they clear the tables, but we're not allowed to go home. Uh, we're like, okay, now this is the part where we have to pay for our dinner. And some guy stood up. You know, just a guy that looked like a school principal or something. He just, or a businessman, looked like he'd be selling cars. Maybe he was a car salesman. And he starts talking. He's going, you know, the end times are near, and the Lord is going to be here very shortly. And when he does, he wants us all to be prepared. And the Lord wants us to bang down ta. He wants us to bang ta, kating pa ta, boo boo dee dee da da boo, ba ling da da. I just remember like the hairs went up on my arms, and I went, oh fuck. What is that? It was awesome. You know, I was like ready to burst out laughing because I thought he was making fun of, of you know, some religious thing. And then he, he did that for like about a minute where he just spouted nonsense and he sat down. Somebody in the audience stood up and said, the Lord 
is telling us now to be prepared for his return. He wants us all to, to beg for forgiveness for our sins and he wants us to be aware that we are in the end times. And that our things are, And as soon as he finished, he sat down. Somebody stood up in the audience and they had a whole other like outer space language like, and they did this thing for like 30 seconds and sat down and somebody popped up and they interpreted it. And it kept going. And I'm like, where the hell are we? And they put us in little groups and it was a recruitment for something called Full Gospel Church. They you went around and they were encouraging contribute? people to speak in tongues. Did you go for it? They can't, got to me and I was like, I just, I went, yabba dabba do, <laughs> yabba dabba do. I just did Fred Flintstone because I wasn't, wasn't sure. And they just looked at me like, okay, you're an asshole. And then they kept going on. Or, or they looked at me and went, okay, you're, you're, Still in league with Satan. Yeah, yeah, of course, we that's it, yeah. But I, but I left there, and I was intrigued by the idea of, of uh, you know, surrendering your intellect mm-hmm. to the spirit. Okay. And the idea that, you know, and it also, cause, and it kind of sunk up with something at the time. Uh, in one of my classes at Kent State, uh, I don't know, a teacher had said, well, you know, they say we only use about 10 to 15% of our brain at the most. And I remember they were postulating what happens with the other 85%. And after that thing, I was like, oh, I get it. So the 15% of the brain that I know about, that's the nanny for the brain, part of the brain that gets to do all the cool shit, the part of the brain that still has, still can communicate, you know, you know, uh, without words. And, um, and that's the part of the, that's the part of the brain that's doing everything fun. And I'm stuck in the part of the brain that, that has to like, like, uh, pay for car insurance and go out and get a job and work a job and has to, clean the laundry for this for for the other part of the brain that gets the free ride and i and so it made me like that next week then i was working in downtown akron as a uh, an apartment building maintenance man yeah okay in this old building i had to go and like steam wallpaper off or pull up ancient carpeting and clean up the crud and put new carpeting in and paint walls and stuff and uh, I just remember there was some crazy guy ranting out in downtown and I remember I walked extra slow and I was listening to what he was saying I was trying to I think is that the other part of the brain (laughs) what's going on here and so it made me really then become more interested in things like Dadaism Uh, I kind of was tying all those things together and I was like looking for, you know, and stream of consciousness people. I started really becoming interested in people that their music was stream of consciousness. And Devo in 75, we opened up for Sun Ra at some show right, yeah, in, sure. in Cleveland, Ohio. That's some and I remember stuff. watching him, and I really yeah, that I found crazy. it really, you know, fascinating because, you know, his, you know, 21 years to the, no, 25 years to the century, 21 21, 21st century and 25 years or whatever he was saying. Uh, he had some lyrics like that. And, and, uh, but he played like this, like he played like a baby and he had his hands open wide like a paw and he would just hit cl- you know, clusters of notes. And there was something about that that was really attractive to me and it made me less interested in the way Rick Wakeman and, and Keith Emerson were playing keyboards. I thought <laughs> yeah. they were playing like silly stuff. And they were making synthesizers sound like um, calliopes and, and silly organs. But this guy was taking keyboards and making them sound really primitive. I thought, I thought you know, it's, it is primitive what he's doing, but what he's doing is closer to Jimi Hendrix than what Keith Emerson's doing, for right. sure, you know. And I just kept... I was a keyboard player and I just kept wanting to figure out how to make my keyboards more plastic and how to make them more, you know, I was looking for other kind of, I didn't know I was looking for another controller at the time, but that's what it was because it, early synthesizers only had a keyboard and um, I, I didn't know enough about electronics to know that you could control 
you know, you trigger a synthesizer with some other <laughs> thing. And, Getting uh, them freaky, yeah. It took Brian Eno to introduce me to that, and that was totally by accident. I was listening to the first Roxy Music album, and, you know, it had really good songs, Inflatable Dolly, and all these kind of really creepy Brian Ferry <laughs> lyrics. But then it got to this song that was just a throwaway song called Editions of You. And it was not really a, a it was a silly song. It was just an up-tempo. It, it would be kind of like, like if you had a vaudeville show, you would use that music to, to like, play things on and off. And everybody yeah. took a solo in it, you know. Uh, Andy McKay was, I think, the sax player, and, the, and everybody... Guitar player got a solo, and then Eno got a solo, and it went wow, and I'm like, that made my hand, hair on my hands, arms stand up, and I was like, he's not using a keyboard. How is he doing that? And then I, I kept researching like what it was, and then finally one of the keyboard magazines showed his keyboard, and it was a uh, an English synth called a Synthi AKS, and um, it had a, a joystick on it. And I just became obsessed with finding, <laughs> you know, other, other uh, controllers. And my little brother, who was playing drums in the beginning of Devo, he, I got him excited about it enough that he stopped playing drums because he just wanted to modify. He, he was like a circuit bender for all of our gear, and he was like looking for ways to expand electrical, I mean, electronic music and electronic mm -hmm. music sounds and stuff like that. And we, we worked on coming up with our own kinds of versions of, of like those triggers like, like Eno had. Oops, that's where that story goes, I guess. <laughs> I don't know where, where did we start? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. This that's, is Fox, that's, that's right. She's dead. Yeah. She's dead. But she was only two bucks a week. That was the... Mm -hmm. If there was any good side, the eighty-five percent of the brain that you're not using, I think, was where we where we were. Yeah, Have you gotten better at using it? I can't say for sure. Um, <laughs> but you're I, not afraid to dive in. I feel like there's like um, I've perforated that that membrane at times, and I think it also has a. I think if anybody who's familiar with people that did a lot of acid, that there's probably <laughs> that's you. That's not me. Not you. Okay. No, I I was friends with Tim Leary, but. I told him, I said, you know, my experiences with acid were both bad. People, somebody dropped like 10 hits on me when I was a kid. And then, uh, and then the next time I took it, it was like the first time I played it with this two-piece band that I had. And I was the keyboard player and I had a drummer. And it's like I looked at my keyboard and because my glasses make everything kind of um, like in a fisheye to make it focused. It's like it accentuated that, and so all of a sudden my keyboard stretched down about 12 <laughs> feet, and I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to play that thing? And I'm standing there, and I'm reaching for those keys, and then I start playing on them, and then my fingers were going through the, between the keys. And my friend who's playing drums is over there, and he's totally out of his mind just hitting <laughs> stuff. And I, I, and I was like, okay, that's the last time I remember going to do that. So that was like 1972 or something. Okay. I, I took my second and final hit of LSD. So Tim was good about it when I told him. I said, you know, I really think you're an amazing person and I really like you and I like your friends and your parties, but if you don't, you know, like push drugs on me, that'd be great. So, because I, I never, I, I always, you know, it's like through the whole time I was in a band, people are handing you drugs always. They love it, yeah, of course. And I just, always kind of like I used to get I gave them I tried giving them back at first and then people would either get hurt or yep. angry yeah and so I thought you know what that just play so along I just, I just went thank you so much man that's so great thank you and then they'd be happy and then you'd you could just like the roadies would go what did you get and you go <laughs> there it is you can have whatever you want it's all yours don't hurt yourself <laughs>
Whip It's obviously the biggest song. Is that the one that you would pick that you'd want everyone to, to no, know you, to you, know, know you by? Like a, no, it was kind of a throwaway as far as I was concerned. And by that point, there was an argument, tug of war in the band, over whether to go even harder core art or to go more commercial. And right, once I that sort of was really, a success. I wasn't the, the one voting for commercial, but... That somehow, and that even didn't seem like it was that commercial, but somehow it, it, it kind of resonated with discos at the time. Go figure. Yeah, it's just become an iconic song as the years have gone by. It sort of just has a life of its own now. It's funny like that, I guess it sort of stops almost being belonging to you and just becomes the world. I wanted to ask you about Mongoloid and PC culture. That was another question I had. I don't know. That's yeah, that's know, sort of all I have written down. Mongoloid that, piece that of culture. That was a song that, like, when it came out on the first album, there were people that attacked it. Right. As being so PC. even then it was sort of a little little but on PC. Well, I hear something interesting. is We have a dozen letters from parents of Mongoloids from that time period that the Mongoloids, the kids, adopted that as their song, and they loved it. Wow, And so cool. Mongoloids ended up, Loving the song, it was like people that had all their chroma had had the right amount of chromosomes that were upset about it. <laughs> Which is usually the case with people getting offended about well, things. Well, you know, they they want to be protective. I mean, I understand why it happened, but but the but it was kind of, I, I it was kind of it was tic- it tickled us that, that it became. <laughs> and in England, I think it got banned. Really? Yeah, I think they banned it. Somebody did. That was yeah. Well, Mark Baker played me that earlier this year and that's what sort of got it me was, it was back in the days when a song called mongoloid could get you ups- could get you banned <laughs> <laughs> i don't think it would fly anymore either i think even you think we're at another time oh i or? think it would be definitely frowned upon mm-hmm. these days especially if you're a bunch of white guys you'd be yeah. well wait a minute if we got a bunch of mongoloids to come on ahead of time and i would and love to see a bunch of mongoloids I'm, I'm using that term, although that's not a politically correct term. Well, either. we're here. We're yeah. <laughs> it, you already did it, so we're just yeah, talking we about it. It's we history can't now. Unstep in it. Yeah, we already <laughs> stepped in it. So yeah. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mark Mothersbar. What a guy! What a fascinating chap. Keep an eye out for him. He's doing shit all the time. He looks like he's doing the new lego movie there's that disenchantment which i said check it out on netflix i really thought the music on that was awesome if you haven't check out the devo song mongoloid there's also the devo track gut feeling which was off the life aquatic soundtrack i really really dig that one there's the girl the girl you want doing a fucking awesome tune as well obviously whip it but you can whip it good whenever you want you know you've heard that one you've we've all whipped it good we all know what that's all about <laughs> all right i think with that, that'll do us. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll be back in a few weeks' time. Thanks to Mark Mother's Bar and his peeps. Thank you for you for listening. Thank you to the internet for existing and for audio so that we can all be here together. You take care. Until next time.